So let's talk about islands. When you're trying to solve a mystery like who are the others or what's up with that smoke monster, it's easy enough to summon one of those WH words to the beginning of whichever question you need to ask. Even if it's all the way down at the end, that Y or when can always just hop on a plane and be at your service in no time at all. But what happens when that word crashes and gets stranded on a desert island? Can you still find the answers you're looking for? I'm Moti Lieberman and this is the Ling Space. Welcome to the Ling Space. One way of thinking about how we build our questions is this. We start out with a normal, everyday declarative statement, stick in some questiony word like who or what, and then move that word over to the front of the sentence. In our episode about movement and traces, we covered some of the reasons why we think this is the right way to talk about what's going on, at least in languages like English. But in the 1960s, we started to realize that this doesn't always work. It turns out that sometimes, when we put a question word into a sentence, it gets stuck. Like, take the sentence, you might wonder when Jack will see Kate again. If we try to rework this proclamation of potential puzzlement into a full-fledged question, say, about who Jack will see again, we get, who might you wonder when Jack will see again? Which sounds super weird. It's like, sometimes the words we put into a sentence end up on these islands that they just can't get off of, no matter how hard they try. Like, they're surrounded by water without any rescue in sight. So as soon as these patterns got discovered, syntacticians started working on explaining why words get stuck in all the places they do. And before long, linguist Noam Chomsky formulated the principle of subjacency, which we touched on in our Principles and Parameters episode. The principle of subjacency proposed that there were these barriers to movement sitting around in our sentences, and that words only have enough strength to climb past one of them. And one of these barriers is what we've been labeling as IP, or inflectional phrase in our syntax trees, basically the parts of sentences that represent full clauses. Let's take a look at how this works. Starting with dynamite could stop the monster, we can see that if we want to turn this sentence into a question, we only have to do two things. Replace the monster with what, and then move it to the front to get what could dynamite stop. It works because that what only has to make it past one IP node. But as soon as we introduce another one into the mix, escape becomes impossible. If we try to turn we should ask how the fence will stop the monster into a question, we're left with what should we ask how the fence will stop? You can see that that what just doesn't have what it takes to cross over both IPs without ruining the whole sentence. There's simply one too many fences in the way. So that seems like a pretty good explanation of what's going on, except not really. The problem is it's actually pretty easy to come up with examples where WH words can cross over a whole bunch of these nodes. Like what gets past three IPs in a sentence like what does Ben think Juliet believes Sawyer knew? In fact, there doesn't seem to be any upper limit to how many clauses a word can escape from. So that means on one hand, we have this great way of explaining why some questions just can't be asked, but on the other, it seems to contradict the data, and that's definitely bad. So what can we do? Well, one solution is to say that when words move around in a sentence, they don't do it in one giant leap. Instead, they make a lot of little skips and jumps, like stepping stones to get across a pond. To see how this works for us, just look at how the word what starts at the end of our sentence, incrementally making its way up to the front. And in each stage, we have a grammatical English question. So here, nothing ever gets in the way of our word as it makes its way to the beginning of the sentence. But if something does get in the way, well, that's when our word gets stuck. Back in the sentence, we should ask how the fence will stop the monster, if we turn that last noun phrase into a what and try to move it anywhere, the how that comes before it gets in the way. It's perched on the very stone that what needs to make it across the pond without getting soaked. So what can't move out at all? The idea that words move in these small, successive cycles lets us hang on to our explanation of why sometimes these WH words get trapped without losing important data. When there's another who or what or where at the front of the clause it's trying to climb out of, it's like the exit to the escape hatch is blocked and it just has to stay down there. And this explains why sometimes even words close to the front of the sentence can't get any further. If we try to turn the man who built the cabin is long gone into a question by moving something out of that relative clause, we get what is the man who built long gone? That who at the top just won't let anything sneak past it. The possibility that operations like movement happen only over short distances has actually become a really important part of modern syntactic theory. If you think back to our very first episode on movement, we talked about how French verbs are a lot closer to the beginning of the sentence than English verbs, since they tend to appear before adverbs in negation instead of after. In tu connais pas Rousseau, or you don't know Rousseau, we can suppose that the verb connais shows up before the negation pas because it has enough strength to move out of its home verb phrase, past pas, and into a higher position in the tree. This is why, when we want to turn the sentence into a question, it's in exactly the right spot to be moved even further to the front, as in connais-tu pas Rousseau? 
As it turns out, the reason we can't say know you not Rousseau in English is that most verbs can't even make it past negation and aren't ever close enough to the front to make it all the way there. Since movement must be local, they're stuck. The only verbs that have it in them to make it that far are auxiliaries like have and be. That's why we can say, have you not met Rousseau? Or are you not familiar with Rousseau? Just like WH words, it looks like verbs can't travel long distances without a few stopovers. And when something's blocking them, that's it. They're trapped. And so, what look like two totally unrelated happenings actually both fall under the purview of the same basic principle, the minimal link condition, which says that when you're moving around in a sentence, you have to move to the closest potential landing site before continuing on your journey. Since it turns out this explains subjacency while explaining some other stuff too, subjacency can comfortably be replaced. Oh, by the way, guess who proposed the minimal link condition? That's right, still Chomsky. Looking back at the long distance movement of WH words, we actually have pretty strong evidence that this is really how it all works. In child speech, for example, we find sentences like, who do you think who the cat chased? Where that who is showing up both at its final destination and in the spot it landed into refuel. And in adult speech, we see multiple copies of WH phrases showing up in languages like Afrikaans and German too, exactly where we'd expect to see them stopping off on their way to the front. Finally, and most surprisingly, we even see these effects in languages like Japanese, which don't move their question words around at all. Look at dare ni doko de atta ka oboite ru no, or do you remember who we met where? We've got two WH words inside the embedded clause competing to get out, but interpreting it to mean who do you remember where we met is just as impossible as the English sentence. The fact that this meaning is blocked suggests that even when we don't hear it happening, WH words need to be able to move around freely in a sentence to get certain meanings out. The minimal link condition even applies to this sort of invisible covert movement of words and phrases too. It looks like when words take a trip, they always make sure to plan for breaks along the way. If they didn't, they'd almost certainly end up on an island somewhere totally lost. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you managed to find your way off the island, you learned that moving things around in a sentence doesn't always go as planned. That words like who and what and even verbs need to break up their long journeys into more manageable pieces. And that the minimal link condition explains how we form our sentences in both English and in other languages. The Link Space is produced by me, Moti Lieberman, and directed by Jeremy's Prévost. This week's episode was written by Stefan Herdebees. Our editor is Georges Coulomb, our music is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Views. We're down in the comments below, or you can bring the discussion back over to our website where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, and try dropping by our store. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal Link Space, please subscribe. Also, you may have noticed that the one background element we've had in every single episode until now is, well, lost. Our kanji figure is gone traveling, and we've left clues for you in the episode. The first person to tell us in the YouTube comments what country kanji went to can have a Link Space mug of their choosing from our store. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Kihin and Nam!